Hello everyone on Fagin Live. It is 22 p.m. or 10 p.m. We are with uh, Alexei Rostovich online, day 47 of war. Uh, hello, Alexei. Good evening. All right, we have about 75,000 people watching us live. Big request to all those, please like us and share links with your friends. It is important to do that, that helps with the algorithm. We already have 700,000 subscribers. And you can also follow the link to Alexei's channel uh, below that video. The same video goes out here and there. All right, let's start with general circumstance, if anything changed during the last 24 hours. Not really. Nothing serious. No, no serious. Uh, same shenanigans in the same areas. Because I can say, based on the press statements and different uh, expert opinions, mostly Western, some Ukrainian, but mostly Western expert opinions, I'm not even taking Russia because it's mostly propaganda here. But even representatives of the Western sources are saying that on the East there is a major offensive getting ready. And they're also saying that some parts, some uh, detachments from Kiev and Chernigov were transferred over to the East and they will be attacking Ukraine within that offensive. Can you say something about that? Yes, we've seen some of these troops there. It's hard to call them real detachments, they're probably beaten up remnants, but uh, we've seen some of them. Can you give us some numbers? Everything they have on the east is about 16 battalion tactical groups. It is hard to portray them as a horrible offensive or dangerous offensive. And I mean, yeah, Eastern Izum, that area. We've seen bigger. So personally, I'm pretty calm about that offensive, about that. And they that includes the ones that they withdrew from Kiev and managed to bring and add to the group on the east. So probably 15, 12 on the east, maybe 12 on the south, a bit on the north, so probably the whole eastern front, including Mariupol, it's probably 35 battalion tactical groups. So 35, 40 battalion tactical groups in the whole Ukraine? on the Eastern Front. It is hard to describe it as a great power. And they're not really waiting to accumulate power, because Moscow, I guess, is demanding. So they keep uh, throwing their new troops into fire piecemeal. And this is the stupidest way to conduct the warfare. I would normally say, God bless for that decision, but really that's uh, kind of not really a blessing for them. They just burn their people, and we thought the second phase will be much more remarkable, but it does not impress us so far. Have you met Zaluzhny today? You met him today? Did you talk to him? We're not interested in details, but what is his attitude about this uh, whole Eastern Offensive? The main piece of news is that nobody forgot the defenders of Mariupol. We are on constant communication with them. Military command is always in calm with Mariupol. And military command is taking certain decisions, and the group in Mariupol is still manageable. They are getting some support. We have not abandoned them. We're doing possible and impossible, as Zeluzhny said. 
We, of course, understand uh, what is that word in Russian, the emotional fatigue of the soldiers and the relatives. But that's one thing. And the other, it's not as horrible for our troops in Mariupol as the other side is trying to present it. There was an effort to join two groups together, and they succeeded. Some people gave up, that's true. Some people surrendered. So, the news that Russia is spreading that some Marines tried to push through to another group, some surrendered. What about that Russian info? They showed us some videos, and we still have controversial data about that. There are two versions. One of them says that it's uh, people who surrendered earlier, and they're just uh, redoing videos of that. And the other is that, yes, some people indeed surrendered, but in much smaller numbers than uh, it is reported. So in Mariupol, do they defend just the factory, the Azovstal, Azov steel factory? Uh, actually, they are controlling about a third of city. I'm not going to add more tragedy to that situation, but they're holding about a third, and we need to understand that that whole emotional thing to remember about Mariupol and their defenders sometimes has a negative backlash too. Because people do feel for their defenders. And very often the situation would be that uh, somebody would be asking for help and then military command is not really releasing. So the optics is that there is a plea for help and nothing in return. So some people can consider that this is a really bad situation there. It is not. It is uh, military order in Mariupol. We're doing what we can, and we're doing what even is not quite possible. We're still pulling it through. And I think we should be communicating about Mariupol in any case. Absolutely. And if you notice, there are maybe three people who are talking about it. There are just three people who are talking about Mariupol on the official side. It's President, it's Zaluzhny, the head of uh, defense, and it's me. It is not an easy subject for communication, yet we still do that. Hundred and fifty thousand people are watching us. More people are joining. We're only eight minutes online. So those who are joining, please don't forget to share the link and to leave your like. Ask questions in our chat. Perfect opportunity to answer them during this live show. So you think Kharkov situation is not really changing? Actually, they are shooting Kharkov more severely today. Uh, some people are dead and also one child died today. You cannot say that nothing is happening. There are no major moves, but tactical fighting is ongoing all the time. Today we hit some of their troops very successfully. They keep shooting us with their artillery or whatever they can use to reach us. It is sort of routine, and the chances seem that the intensity will weaken over time because Russian troops are losing the capacity to coordinate their efforts together and also losing some of the ammo. Also, our troops are tired, battle-tired, so we should not expect amazing breakthroughs. It is day 47, and it is still the same troops that we have that are fighting all the time. And it is mostly tactical fighting. I need to remind that tactical fights are within 
5 to 10 kilometers range. When the conflict started, I should mention that there were some operations that advanced for 50 or 10 kilometers during a day. Right now, that is not possible. And both sides are rather tired. Can you project the situation when there is no major advancements and the war turns into like position war? I don't see where they can get the might to push or to defend what they have now. 16 battle groups? That's nothing. Because when we had 35 just around Kiev, that was impressive. Right now, 16 for much wider front. Rather beaten up. And it's sometimes real sad to see them deploying their civil equipment, painted green, civil vehicles. This is not exactly the Russian troops that invaded. We are not the fresh troops either, but the dangerous or aggressive offensive that exists in propaganda, it does not exist in real life. Well, that's a part of war. Yeah, same as our part is to dispel all this fog that Russian propaganda machine is trying to pull. So what do you think? Is there conscription in Ukraine? How is your reserve doing that potentially can join the fight? Well, we can conscribe about 5 million people. They'll need weapons, right? Yeah, that's our main question. What do we give them? What arms do we give them? Same situation in Russia. They can call... 17 million of men call to arms, but what do you arm them with? All machine guns? Yeah, 17 million people with machine guns. That is a big question. I would not envy Kremlin in this situation. 17 million with guns? They might not want to go to Great Front. They may want to go to Moscow. And it's much harder to create a proper military unit out of them. So we're 14 minutes online, and let me ask you something else. Sounds like Germany is going to supply you with some equipment. Oh, I keep listening daily about all these new hardware. Where? The moment they supply, I'll see that. And the moment they supply, we all will see that, because the battle situation will change. So, can you consider that this shyness, so to say, uh, in supplying heavy armament is sort of conceptual agreement with Moscow, you don't do certain things and we don't supply that? No, I think this is a reality struggle within the Western mind, because Russia has a picture in their mind and West has a picture in their mind, and in West they kind of afraid of Moscow and consequences. We are fighting the war, we're not afraid. I'm listening to the argument, and from psychological side, the argument is uh, both scary and entertaining. 
because it is very disconnected from reality. But the good thing is that they're still giving stuff, and we understand in smaller volumes and not exactly the items we would love to have, but it's better than nothing. So it's still a positive progress. So what do you think? When you get heavy armaments, would you start talking about offensive? We'll win the war. If we get what we asked for, we will win the war. If we get maybe half of what we asked, we will finish it in a position, positional struggle that will be to a greater degree in our favor. And if we don't get anything that will end in positional struggle, but it will be a tough one, and it will neither be a success for Russia nor a success for us. There will be a lot of partisan fighting with saving ammo. It will be a whole different story. Maybe somebody on the West would appreciate that. Do you think somebody may like it? I think there is an opportunity. It, it's, it's a possibility that somebody may appreciate that if we struggle longer. Why do you think they need it? So we tire Russia. So they get deeper and sunk more cost in it. So they really get worn out and spent everything they have in this war. In Russian favor, it would be to conclude this fight and sign some peace treaty. I, actually, Russians are getting tired, and I'm thinking they're really somebody in their command is rooting for Ukraine because they are sending their planes really recklessly, and they're losing. Yeah, losing at least one daily. They had 350, 360 battle ready at the beginning of war. We shot down about 150 of them, 160 of them. That's 50% down. That's 10 years of manufacturing. And with sanctions, it could be 20 years till they re replenish their aviation park. And by the time they build that, there'll be a whole other generation of airplanes in the world. So the, the, there are international components that they're using. Avionics, I'm quite sure that's foreign because it's impossible that Russia has national Russian-built avionics. It's always been a trouble. Yeah, I agree with you. And let's look at also Russian tank factory. They make maybe 30 to 60 tanks a year. So by the amount of tanks we destroyed, that's 10 to 15 years of them, of their work to replenish that. Same in planes, they're slower there, so at least it's 15, 20 years till they replenish what they've lost. This country was going to compete with NATO and they've lost most of their planes. Second army of the world was threatening the whole NATO bloc, but could not overcome Ukraine on the way to NATO. So even a child I would understand that this campaign is lost, that you need to save your face and need to withdraw your troops and save whatever you have left. Because with the current tempo, you will not even have a proper second round in this war. And I have to also calm down my viewers when I said that the war will continue to 2035 and some people really took it to heart. I voiced the worst scenario. This is military planning. When you're ready to the worst scenario, you're ready for everything else. It does not mean that it will be this way. And I have to compliment our president and his office that are doing a lot to prevent this worst scenario. 
and also other things that you know the support and army rebuild that we hope will get support from the countries in the world that will change the situation everything will be all right what is the most important is that the main supplier of equipment and uh, military armaments is the army of russian federation they are our biggest supplier for the amount of equipment we capture their worst opponent is Russian command, because they're, the way they're fighting, one more week and they'll lose, they'll be at over 50% of their active airplane force. It also takes time for pilots and professionals to train, so it takes time. Five years in college, 10 to 15 years practice. What is the goal? Why do you want to leave half of your flying pilots with equipment, with planes? For what goals here in Ukraine? What is the justification? There is no justification really, it's just psycho-political goals, and they... Have they imprisoned Surkov? That's what they're saying. I need to show you a secret. So if he's arrested, he might be in Lefortovo. This is more like isolation facility. It's a FSB prison. So there are some lawyers who are going to visit their customers in jail. And it's hard to hide who is in jail because attorneys have to... They, what they do, they draw... They basically gamble who goes to see their customers and help the others if they can. So they reveal whom they're going to. And according to that chat, that KGB general is there. Okay, so let's suppose he is in prison. That means it's a deep cleansing that's happening in FSB ranks. So that they're, they're basically pulling one by one different figures to blame them for their failures in Ukraine. It's kind of like FSB tactics, right? You do it one by one, you don't get all 20 of them at a time because, you know, that group may object. So it is a proper strategy for them, one by one. I know people who've been participating in that. Beseda, the saint of the saint, Surkov, another saint of the saints, they both were on Maidan, they were both participating. I know people who were playing chess with Girkin when he was there on Maidan. As the guard of that uh, icon that they used there, and now he's saying complete. <laughs> referring to Girkin, the terrorist who was in charge of one of those uh, pseudo republics on the right, he is already blaming everybody in the command, in Russian command. So, looking at what's happening there, the whole cleansing means that Kremlin understands that the situation is catastrophic, that the whole design of the operation and understanding of the current situation was wrong, was faulty. It appears that they understand that. At the same time, they are still continuing the operation. They continue to leave their troops and their equipment in Ukraine. They just bury that. Why are they doing it? I think Putin is getting lied to by his top military advisors who are saying that a little more and we'll get them, just a little more. And just look at Azovstal where they supposedly used chemical weapons. Or like Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced that yesterday, I think, that they've changed the plans of their campaign for the fourth time and now they're officially fighting against America and Ukraine. I'm always asking, why are you not afraid that America will actually listen to your statements and 
decide that, okay, if you're fighting against us in Ukraine, we will fight against you as well. And supply us, not even join us, but supply us with more armaments. So that underlines that Russia has lost strategic planning. They are not looking forward to three, four years at least. They are doing just uh, tactical level planning. And, for example, in the United States there are three parties. One of them says, let's not interfere. Another one will say, let's join and, and just dump everything in Ukraine, give them all weapons. And the party that says, let's come in agreement with Russia, that is weakest now, after this statement. The party that wants to supply more armaments to Ukraine is strongest after this Kremlin statement. And that means they have not really thought properly their statement through. That means they're already discombobulated and their decisions are hectic. So, the way they spend their forces in Ukraine, these statements that they make, it is a sign for me that they're in a horrible crisis. Basically, it means that there are no people who can... Sometimes it means there are no people who can make the decision to change things. Sometimes it means that they do not have tools to implement their will or to follow through with a good decision. That's why I'm saying every day Russian troops and everything, Russian front, will only get worse because it appears that the system is really oscillating and you're facing some serious internal issues. In the next couple of weeks, the chaos will increase in Kremlin because the number of negative signals and stupid decisions that enhance the situation of doom will only be growing there. It is kind of like aviation navigation. If you make a, an error or if there is an aviation issue, so you have a chance to correct that. You either figured what's up and you corrected it or you took a wrong decision or were just not ready to take a decision. So. On the second stage, your funnel is much smaller and your problems are bigger. And instead of 15 seconds that you had for the first decision, you perhaps have three seconds to make a new decision. And if you don't make a right one in the next step, you will have less than three seconds. And it will probably be a catastrophic decision. Stage four, five, and six, they're uncontrollable. Stage four is a miracle if you find a way out of it, and stage five and six only test pilots, in some cases, have enough training to leave that situation unscathed. Most pilots will die if they go that deep. So right now, Russian Federation is going deeper into that funnel. They're having less time to make a right decision. And right now, with the continuation of military offensive, they're really going deeper into the third phase, in the third step. At the end of it, they'll basically run out of troops, run out of equipment. They may have internal troops, Russian Guard, and some of the special police forces, but they're not military capable. They're not war fighters. So right now their car is really oscillating while driving, you know, and the wheel is about to fall off, or two of them. And it's really shaking. If they keep riding it, the wheels will fall off and they'll find themselves in a ditch. So, in your opinion, do you think by the 9th of May, their Victory Day Parade, they'll achieve anything? 
I'll tell you what, they're not even thinking about 9th of May. We already have some information. At first, they had 24th to start the second offensive, then 28th, then 4th. Now they're leading that operation for five days, and yet it's not a, a strong phase. It's not a strong offensive what they're projecting. They're just announcing it and media is peddling it. And then ours are looking at it and thinking, oh, this is going to be a real fight, a real offensive. Return to Kiev, attack on Kharkov, attack on Odessa, and then from Odessa will reach Kiev, going north. There are a lot of crazy suggestions floating around. So I'm trying to explain to our journalists that they should stop scaring our people. Don't listen to Russian propaganda. Or at least consider that against the reality. Just stop scaring Ukraine people and stop referring to weird sources that nobody can find online even if they really make an effort to do so. Well, what can I say? For these reasons, we do have our show with you that we can dispel some of this stupidities and bring more actual facts to people. All right, we have more people watching us, we are 30 minutes live. So direction of Kherson for Ukrainian troops, is it hopeful? Are we still looking to advance there? What can I say? I cannot exactly answer the question when you posted it. But let me think. I want to say that uh, Russians are doing their best to break our counteroffensive. So, Russian counterattacks mean that they exist for something, that there are some offensive actions that they're aimed to dispel or derail. So, that means that the Ukrainian army might be doing something there. So, news from yesterday that some of the equipment S-300 anti-missile anti-aircraft systems supplied from Europe, that they've been destroyed? I can supply the statement from Slovakia that you should not worry about these complexes, you should be worried for those systems that they might hit when deployed. So, that is the situation. 33 minutes, uh, last question, our favorite question about negotiations, which according to the last statements of Kremlin, or what Lavrov wrote us, that we discuss now, that apparently Russia is fighting against American domineering in the world. So one of the statements is that we do not see any negotiations in public space. It doesn't mean that no negotiations are happening. They may be out of the public eye. So, some people are saying that, oh yeah, the negotiations are going. All right, I cannot really comment on the negotiations. I can comment on some of the statements that you see. The sides have not reached agreement in their views, but there are some things that need to be clarified on the battlefield. These are difficult negotiations, but I believe on the battlefield will uh, give our side enough materials to proceed. Okay, all right. 
Almost 255,000 watching us, 34 minutes live. I think we can conclude for today and continue tomorrow. Nothing is going to change tomorrow, right? You'll still be available. And we'll uh, talk about other events with more detail, such as Mariupol and the chemical weapons used there. So we'll ask more questions about that, and Alexei will tell us. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.